Hey everyone, Jason Sherman here. In today's episode of Zero to CEO, I'm going to talk to a visionary entrepreneur and angel investor, Luke Diaz. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm a huge fan of the show. It's an honor. That's awesome. And um, I really appreciate that. I do. And today we're going to talk about empowering underrepresented founders and entrepreneurs. Uh, you have DBT Ventures, Do Big Things. So you're looking for entrepreneurs who do big things. Uh, before we jump into like underrepresented founders, that's a big hot topic these days. Uh, what do you see in the market in terms of like what happened during the pandemic in terms of VC funding, angel funding? Uh, I noticed like uh, from what I hear, at least I'm currently fundraising, it's really hard to get funding in the tech sector these days. Is that true? What have you seen happen? What should people expect? I think your observation is spot on, Jason. The funding environment right now is one of the most challenging I've seen in the last five years. The reason for that is a lot of venture capitalists made huge bets in 2020, 2021, where this, and I'm refining my comments, at least the SaaS enterprise, kind of like technology space, mm -hmm. they invested at peak valuations. And there's since been a SaaS recession, if not a depression over the last two years. So as a result, a lot of venture capitalists, traditional cap venture capitalists have tightened up their pocketbooks made fewer allocations and are really waiting for the sector to bottom out. The good news is we have seen, seen increased earnings in the last quarter. So you are starting to see some of these technology companies emerge. Um, I've seen it personally in private equity, smaller non-public startups as well, where you actually are seeing a, see a rebound off the bottom. So I actually think that the bottom is behind us and the, the funding environment will become uh, a little more friendly than it has over the last two years. That's great. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I've always wondered, you know, I, people read the news, of course, TechCrunch, Mashable, you know, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, et cetera, all the big ones, you know, so-and-so startup raises $50 million. So so-and-so raises 5 million even um, for not even having a platform. Like I see this all the time. They just raise it on an idea. Now we know they were ex Googlers or ex PayPal or ex some big company, Facebook, where that's why they got that money, which to a lot of us founders find that to be very unfair, of course, um, because for, for example, I built a platform with $300,000 that they've built for $100 million and I can't raise the money that I need. So how do you get out there? I mean, maybe it's an easy answer, maybe it's not. How do you get out there if you've already built a scalable platform, already have traction, already have a great team, already have a great presence online, you're pretty much ready to just scale, you don't have to build anything. How do you get the money you need to scale? I talk to a lot of founders with exactly that same question. The most successful founders I've found have been able to tap into their immediate network and do a traditional friends and family round. That might be obvious. You have a lot of amazing entrepreneurs in your audience that have might have already tapped that well, but I don't want to brush over it because for those that might not have, I just talked to a founder yesterday who's raised uh, 1.2 million from his friends, family and professional network. That's a lot of capital. That's yeah, actually one of the largest That's friends and family rounds I've seen in a while. So, because friends and family is usually would, it's usually attributed to a smaller amount. Like we did friends and family, but it was nowhere near that much. So, you know, yeah, we're looking like a couple hundred grand, yeah, yeah hundred, top, maybe two hundred, exactly. Just to get, so we're lo we're looking for like most people who come to me are looking for that like five hundred thousand seed round or two fifty to kind of get some advertising dollars in their pocket so they can really ramp up user acquisition. Um, mm -hmm. So assume you've already done friends and family. Assume that. What's the next step after that? The next step, you have a, you have a few options. Uh, where, where I typically play as an angel investor is I'm typically coming in right after the friends and family round. And so I'll just speak for myself and then I'll open yep. the aperture to broader options. I'm looking for an anchor investor or sometimes I am the anchor investor where these founders are very creative and they're able to get more money because once they secure someone of note, it might even be a friends and family type scenario right. where that person has some credibility of their own. Maybe they were a leader at a well-known tech company. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were financially successful and they have somewhat of an online pre 
apprentice. They've asked that person or sometimes me to, hey, can I use your name when I'm going out shopping my idea? Because the credibility and the social proof, we're all very much social animals, right? Yep. And the credibility that comes with securing someone of note to believe in you can then be worth an exponent of value because then you can showcase that to subsequent investors and increase the likelihood of a check coming your way or in today's terms, mostly a wire and a safe note. Um, so you're, so, br- so you're bringing up you're bringing up a really good point, and it's super duper relevant today, especially because we you know we launched our startup on WeFunder to try to raise you know X amount of millions to try to really scale this thing, and everyone in the ecosystem of that says you need a lead investor to lead the round, and we don't have one, right? We just have our our angel who's also a co-founder, so that doesn't count. Um, so we've been struggling to find what you just mentioned. So that's a, this is a great point you're bringing up. Everybody needs to find a lead investor to kind of be the face of the round to add credibility to the round. That is so difficult to do. It's, it's harder than you think we've been pitching hundreds and hundreds and I'm somebody who everybody knows, you know, Mm -hmm. I've been, I've been in the public for decades, uh, winning awards left and right, launching products left and right. And even I can't get a lead investor. So I can't even imagine, underrepresented entrepreneurs, which we can talk about a little bit. My co-founder is female, right? She's a large percentage holder of the company. She's been trying to get that female representation in the investment networks and cannot. So again, I have to ask, how does she tap into the female-centric investors out there who are specifically looking for that or Hispanic, I'm Hispanic? How do we get that kind of you know, we're trying every angle and we're not we're not succeeding in that realm. So any advice would be helping me, her and all the other people who are asking me the same question. A big part of why I created uh, DBT Ventures was to address that explicit gap that you just called out specifically with female founders and people of diverse backgrounds. They're historically underfunded by a factor of six to 10 X. So just to put some numbers on that, like females actually found about 20% of startups, but they only received 2% of the funding. Jesus. This has been cited in TechCrunch. I've seen it in the journal. It, my, my hypothesis is, yeah, it's an appalling statistic. And I think it has to do with inherent bias of most of the capital allocators being male. Mm. It's a male dominated industry. And so part of what I was trying to address was that gap because there's just some amazing talent out there knocking on doors, just like you and your co-founder that are glossed over for perhaps the wrong reasons. So there are firms like DBT Ventures that are specifically trying to solve that problem. I have a short list of uh, the top 10 that I have worked with, and I'd be happy to share that list in the show notes. Yeah, but I love that. Those, there are firms that are trying to solve that exact problem. And um, not go for the kind of fix the sins of the past, if you will, and <laughs> and broaden their aperture to to look at um, a, a more diverse cohort of founders. The other thing is bootstrapping. You don't necessarily need, uh, and it it really depends on the the unit economics and the business itself. But some of the most successful founders I've ever worked or have the privilege to to uh to back we're able to bootstrap to a a certain point call it 500k maybe a million bucks in arr where all of a sudden you now have so much more leverage because you've literally bootstrapped and you've you've self-funded and you've created a business that didn't rely on venture capital um that's the most exactly, canonical example of this that's where we are that's i was just gonna say that's exactly where we are right now we've done all that and now we're ready to scale so i get it and that that's impressive because you've 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 out survived and out executed yep. so many in the in the same group. Um, my mind goes to a gentleman named Jeremy Clark, who uh, like ten years ago founded a company called WebMerge, which is a simple technology platform. Didn't kept a really lean staff. He I think he grew it from one million to two million, up to five million, and then he sold it to Formstack for a hundred million Jeez. after about eight years of work. And it became Formstack Documents, 
that company was completely bootstrapped. I think there's maybe a small friends and family round, but the value was there in the product such that customers were willing to pay enough so that venture capital uh, wasn't needed. That is not, you know, that's a very ideal path. It really depends on the product and the engineering talent, but there are bootstrapping avenues where all of a sudden VCs will be knocking at your door because you've built something so uniquely uh, sustainable on your own. You know, I'm a huge supporter of bootstrapping. I mean, this podcast is literally called Strap on Your Boots. My book is Strap on Your Boots. My course, Startup Essentials. Like, I've been bootstrapping my whole life, but I have, I've been finding, and, and, and with my dev shop where I was building people's startups for them for, you know, a decade, I kept finding the same thing happen. So you're saying bootstrap, build something, MVP, whatever, get your customers, start showing traction. But there's always going to be this moment when you reach this kind of wall or an obstacle of you can't get enough critical mass without advertising dollars. It's just the reality of the situation. Uh, we're currently, for just as a real example, we're currently getting about 50 new members a day on our platform, which is wow. fan, which is fantastic. We're at 15,000 15, plus users, active 54%, but we can't grow any faster than that because we can't afford to make our advertising dollar budget higher than it already is. So how do you even go? It's like without money, you can't go further. It's, it's that's yeah. pe that's what people ask me. Like, how am I supposed to market this thing I built? You know, that's a a very common challenge, and I've heard that a lot from founders, especially over the last year and a half, where dollars were scarce and they did have this upside opportunity that felt distant because mm -hmm. they couldn't capitalize on the advertising opportunity. A few of them inverted the problem and said, my goal is to grow customers and revenue. What if I didn't rely on expensive high CAC advertising practices to drive that? Then that opened up doors and playbooks that were low CAC. How do we reduce the customer acquisition cost through various tactics? Some very successful businesses have launched highly scalable referral programs um reference programs you're familiar with like the common net promoter system uh where you ask the question like you know a scale yep. one to ten how likely are you likely to recommend uh jason's business what i found is that most companies don't then follow up with their promoters <laughs> and ask them hey is there anyone in your network or any other friends that could benefit or think you lo would love working with this with this with the, what we offer when you think through those things and actually lay out a plan, there is so much low hanging fruit within your user community where they would happily go to bat for you and pull in referrals, which you don't have to pay a high CPM or a CPC on a Facebook or right. a Google advertising. So there are a lot of low cost, low CAC playbooks that tap into the power of the community and specifically like the promoters in that community that might be able to drive growth without the heavy spend. You know, again, you're bringing up a really good point um, because as we're pitching investors and we're submitting our pitch deck and, and you know, applying to Y Combinator this week, everyone wants to know what's your CAC. That's what they keep asking. And we've managed to get ours down to 79 cents a user, whereas 80% of That's our incredibly users- incredibly low. Well, not only that, just hear this out. We've hit 80% of our users are organic. So we've done what you just said. You wow. just said you you just asked how do you figure out a way to lower your CAC and get more referrals? Well, that's what we're doing. We're getting more organic growth now. So we just keep thinking to ourselves, imagine if we got that in, you know, infusion of cash, how big it would get and how quick it would go. So everyone keeps asking me the same thing. How do we get this low CAC? How do we do organic growth? I tell them everything in this podcast and I show them our our documents, our data, data doesn't, you know, we make data-driven decisions. So, um, so let's, let's let everybody know how they can talk to you guys more and how they can get information from you directly and maybe even get funding from you. Absolutely. So my, the company website is dbtventures.com. One of the things that when I, when I was first starting out my entrepreneurial journey, I was trying to just show value. I was a nobody with no track record. I was trying <laughs> to show value to like creative entrepreneurs like you. 
And what I heard from them was they, they shared this, they, they want to read more books. They want to become like a high, you know, a highly educated person and, but they don't have a lot of time. So one of the things I started doing was reading the books on their wish list, And then I would send them a short summary, five, six pages of that book. And that became this DBT library, if you will, nice. that now gets five, 10,000 downloads a month. So uh, if some of your audience wants to kind of touch base or even just like check out some books, yeah, that sounds I would good. point them to the, to the library of um, dbtventures.com. And I, I'm reviewing 10 to 20 ideas a week. So I would love to talk oh, wow. to you personally and other folks that are looking for funding. My typical check size is 25 to 250K. Um, so I wouldn't say I'm a massive allocator, but usually that amount of horsepower or dry powder is enough to do something. Yeah, and not only that, that amount is the exact amount we need for the We Funder, for example, to get the SEC thing kind of going and then be able to get follow-on funding from people that have said, once you get that lead in there, we'll pull in another million bucks yeah. or something. So I get it. Nice. Awesome. DBTVentures.com. Guys, check it out. I love the library idea. Guys, read the books. It sounds like you put a lot of work and effort into it. So use the resources and I uh, hope you guys learned something and we'll talk to you guys in the next episode.